guys. Uh, welcome to today's uh, lecture on poetry. We're still looking at modern American poetry. Today we're going to be talking about um, probably my favorite American poet, Robert Frost, 1874 to 1963. And so to start us off um, talking about Robert Frost, I was going to play a little um, YouTube video for you with just like a mini um, biography so you can know a little bit more about him and then we will talk about him. So let me get this started for you. And then we will talk some more about Robert Frost and his poems. Little Red Riding Hood. Let's start the story a different way. It was dark inside the wolf. Robert Frost is one of the most widely read and beloved of American poets, as well as one of its greatest. Four-time Pulitzer Prize winning poet, Robert Frost was a national celebrity, famous for writing poems about rural life using American colloquial speech. Robert Frost is well known for a few poems that he managed to lodge in everyone's head, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, also Mending Wall, and The Road Not Taken, of course, is probably the most famous of all of his poems. While most people associate Robert Frost with New England, he was born in San Francisco on March 26, 1874, and he moved to New England at age 11 after the death of his father. Frost began writing poetry in high school, where he met his future wife, Eleanor White. He briefly attended Dartmouth, then went to Harvard in 1897, but left before graduating due to illness and his wife's pregnancy. After Harvard, Frost took up farming. During this time, he lost two children to influenza, and he wasn't a very good farmer. Uh, the farm did not thrive, but his work thrived. While Frost was able to get a few poems published, he was unable to get a book published. So in 1912, he sold his farm and took his family to live in England, hoping to find better luck with publishers. Within a few months of arriving in England, Frost found a publisher for his poems. The first book, A Boy's Will, was reviewed rather quickly by none other than Ezra Pound, who gave it a very favorable review. Shortly after World War I broke out, Frost moved back to the United States and settled in Franconia, New Hampshire, where he wrote and began his long teaching career, starting off at Amherst College. Robert Frost was really the first bard on campus. He taught at various universities, Amherst, Michigan, Harvard, Dartmouth, Middlebury. He moved around a lot. He was in and out of universities, and as he used to call it, barding around. By the end of his career, Robert Frost was showered with honors. He received over 40 honorary degrees. He also received the Congressional Gold Medal and four Pulitzer Prizes. At the age of 86 in 1961, Robert Frost was asked to read at John Fitzgerald Kennedy's inauguration. The land was ours before we were the land. She was our land more than 100 years before we were her people. At the time, it was as much an honor for Kennedy as it was for Frost. Robert Frost died in Boston, Massachusetts at the age of 89 on January 29, 1963. Poetic to the end, Frost's tombstone read, I had a lover's quarrel with the world. When Amherst College built the Robert Frost Library, Kennedy agreed to give the keynote address, and it was one of the great speeches of his presidency. In that speech, Kennedy wrote, when power corrupts, poetry cleanses. He was thinking very much of Robert Frost as a poet who spoke truth to power. Robert Frost felt very strongly about form. He once famously said, free verse is like playing tennis without a net. It ain't tennis. And Frost was tennis all the way. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that little um, biography about Robert Frost to help us uh, just to know a little bit more about Robert Frost. And um, so he did follow traditional forms. As you heard her say, he didn't like um, he didn't like free verse. And so he followed traditional forms like sonnet, blank verse, um, rhyming, quatrains. But he did have that modern spirit of skepticism. And his main focus in his writings was on man rather than on nature. 
Uh, the details of nature kind of function as a backdrop for him for human thought and action. And you heard in the um, biography there about how he um, wrote poetry, he farmed, he did uh, teach at University of Michigan for a little while and several other colleges, won four Pulitzer Prizes. Um, all um, good information to know about him. And one of his interests later in life was the biblical character of Job. And he felt that he had some special sympathy because of his own misfortunes. Um, three of his children actually died. Uh, his wife died in 1938. One of his sons committed suicide. Uh, one of his daughters had mental illness. So he felt like he had all these um, problems, just like Job did. And, but he um, kind of had a bitter spirit, uh, kind of built this bitter spirit in him, this bitter rejection of biblical truth. Um, he wrote his own epitaph, and you heard them mention that, that he had a lover's quarrel with the world. He wrote it, I would have written of me on my stone, I had a lover's quarrel with the world. So kind of, um, you kind of see that bitterness, that skepticism there kind of coming out. He also was a very um, regional writer. He had intense regionalism um, in his work. A lot of his work he wrote about New England was kind of the backdrop, but that doesn't mean it was only about New England, right? It was representative of life and not just our nation, but the whole human race. So he uses it uh, kind of as a synecdoche. A synecdoche is a figure of language where that uses a part to represent the whole. That's what he did. He used New England life to represent life as a whole. So unlike the poetry of his contemporaries or other poets of his time, his poems usually teach a lesson. Um, there is something to be learned about it, whether it's the road not taken or the mending wall um, and, and we'll look at some of these poems and you'll see that there is some kind of insight, some kind of lesson that he's trying to give. Um, you also notice he did not go to the extremes of the other poets of his day. Like he is not going to sound as bitter and cynical as uh, Edwin Arlington Robinson with Richard Corey, you know, committing suicide and all of that. But you are going to see some uh, skepticism that kind of comes out in his poems. He doesn't leave really any place um, for God in his poetry. So let's dive right in. Um, if you will look at page 562, I'm looking at the pasture. This short poem um, is an invitation for you as the reader to come with him, the poet. Right In a lot of his poems, he speaks in first person like he's speaking directly to you, the reader, and it is that way with this one. He says, I'm going out to clean the pasture spring. I'll only stop to rake the leaves away and wait to watch the water clear. I may. I shan't be gone long. You come too. I'm going out to fetch the little calf that's standing by the mother. It's so young it totters when she licks it with her tongue. I shan't be gone long. You come too. So he's wanting to invite you, the reader, to, to come with him and enjoy uh, the New England life, the rural life there in New England. All right, now the gift outright a very, very famous poet. Um, as they mentioned in the biography that he read this, or recited this at the inauguration of President Kennedy in January of 1961, but what they didn't tell you was that was not the plan. He had written a different poem um, that he had prepared to read at the inauguration, but because of it was so windy and the sunlight was so bright and he couldn't read what he had written, so he finally gave up and just ended up reciting the gift outright. And so I have a clip of that, so you can see that how he's trying to read his original poem and he can't do it, and so someone tries to help him. The ceremony also produced an unforgettable incident involving the late Robert Frost as the poet sought to read his inaugural ode. I can't see him this It's about the new order of the ages that God, that in their Latin, uh, our founding sages, God uh, gave us his approval of. Uh, uh, let me help. <laughs> I just have to get through as I can. 
The ceremony also. So you can see how he was trying to use that that person's hat to kind of block um, the sun, so that he could continue on with his with reading, but it didn't work. So then he ended up reciting um, the gift outright, probably his most famous. So let's look at it. The, the land was ours before we were the lands. Just stop with that line right there. What do you think that means? The land was ours before we were the lands, before we were, right, before we were uh, Americans. She was our land more than 100 years before we were her people. She was ours in Massachusetts, in Virginia, but we were England, still colonials. So he's saying this land was ours even before we were Americans, even before we had our own country, when we just came over and were settling. Possessing what we still were unpossessed by, possessed by what we now no more possessed. Something we were withholding made us weak until we found out that it was ourselves we were withholding from our land of living and forthwith found salvation in surrender. Such as we were, we gave ourselves outright. The deed of gift was many deeds of war. To the land vaguely realizing westward, but still unstoried, artless, enhanced, such as she was, such as she would become. So it took us many, many wars, right? It took uh, wars to get our land um, to what we wanted, moving westward, realizing um, the land was gradually realizing its potential under the influence of the westward, uh, the westward movement. And so just talking about how our country and how it is, it was um, a gift and how it's grown over the years. The Road Not Taken, page 564, this is probably his most famous poem, at least one of the most famous. Uh, the Road Not Taken is very symbolic. It is a universal situation. Is he talking about a literal road in the woods? Well, that is what he is, is writing, but that's not what he's actually talking about. It's symbolic. All of us in our lives have times where we come to a situation where we have to choose between two alternatives. And it's not even that one is bad and one is good. They both might be good choices, but we have to decide which one we're going to choose. And that choice is going to make all the difference in our life. The decision, whatever it is, whichever one we make, will have lasting consequences. So let's look at the road not taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps a better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no strep, step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet, knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Notice his line there, uh, line 14 and 15, knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. Because at first he's like, oh, I'm going to choose this one. I'll come back to this one another day. But then he gets real with himself. And he says, you know what? I know how things go and life just gets going and wait. This leads to this, which leads to this. I'll probably never come back. But someday I'm going to be telling this story about how there were two roads and I chose this one. I'll be telling it with a sigh. I chose this one. And it's made all the difference. Now, he doesn't tell us, is that a good sigh? Is it a happy sigh? Is it a regretful sigh? We don't know. He kind of leaves that up to you as the reader. The next one we're going to look at is called The Death of a Hired Man. This is a story. It's a narrative, a dialogue, a drama. Uh, it's even been turned into a one-act play. Um, so there are three people in this poem. There's a farmer, and there's his wife, and then there's this old, incompetent, hired hand that's always worked for them and always comes back when it's harvest season to work for them. And this is a story about how he comes back one year. Um, a line that you should remember from this is home is a place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. And I do have a recording of this as well, where you can hear Robert Frost reading this story to us 
and then um, when it's over I can kind of explain to you what was going on in the story and I want to see if you can figure out um, what the irony is at the end of the story. Mary sat musing on the lamp flame at the table waiting for Warren. When she heard his step, she ran on tiptoe down the darkened passage to meet him in the doorway with the news and put him on his guard. As Silas is back. She pushed Warren outward with her through the door and shut it after her. Be kind, she said. She took the market things from Warren's arms and set them on the porch, then drew him down to sit beside her on the wooden steps. When was I ever anything but kind to him? But I'll not have the fellow back, he said. I told him so last day, didn't I? If he left then, I said that ended it. What good is he? Who else will harbor him at his age for the little he can do? What help he is, there's no depending on. Off he goes always when I need him most. He thinks he ought to earn a little pay, enough at least to buy tobacco with, so he won't have to beg or be beholden. All right, I say, I can't afford to pay any fixed wages, though I wish I could. Someone else can, then someone else will have to. I shouldn't mind his bettering himself, if that were what it was. You can be certain when he begins like that, there's someone at him trying to coax him off with pocket money in haying time when any help is scarce. In winter, he comes back to us. I'm done. Not so loud. He'll hear you. Mary said. I want him to. He'll have to sooner or later. He's worn out. He's asleep beside the stove. When I came up from Rose, I found him here, huddled against the barn door, fast asleep. Miserable sight. And frightening, too. You needn't smile. I, I didn't recognize him. I wasn't looking for him. And he's changed. Wait till you see where did you say he'd been? He didn't say. I dragged him to the house and gave him tea and tried to make him smoke. I tried to make him talk about his travels. Nothing but do. He just kept nodding off. What did he say? Did he say anything? But little. Anything. Mary confessed he said he'd come to ditch the meadow for me. Warren. Uh, but did he? I just want to know. Of course he did. What would you have him say? Surely you wouldn't grudge the poor old man some humble way to save his self-respect. He added, if you really care to know, he meant to clear the upper pasture, too. That sounds like something you've heard before. Warren, I wish you could have heard the way he jumbled everything. I stopped to look two or three times. He made me feel so queer to see if he was talking in his sleep. He ran on Harold Wilson... You remember the boy you had in haying four years since? He's finished school and teaching in his college. Silas declares you'll have to get him back. He says they two will make a team for work. Between them they will lay this farm as smooth. The way he makes that in with other things. He thinks young Wilson, a likely lad, though daft on education. You know how they fought all through July under the blazing sun. Silas up on the cart to build a load. Harold along the side to pitch it on. Yes, I took care to keep well out of earshot. Well, those days troubled Silas like a dream. You wouldn't think they would, how some things linger. Harold's young college boy's assurance piqued him. After so many years, he still keeps finding good arguments he sees he might have used. I sympathize. I know just how it feels to think of the right thing to say too late. Harold's associated in his mind with Latin. He asked me what I thought of Harold saying he studied Latin like the violin because he liked it. That an argument. He said he couldn't make the boy believe he could find water with a hazel prong, which showed how much good school had ever done him. He wanted to go over that. But most of all, he thinks if he could have another chance to teach him how to build a load of hay. I know, that's Silas' one accomplishment. 
He bundles every forkful in its place and tags and numbers it for future reference so he can find and easily dislodge it in the unloading. Silas does that well. He takes it out in bunches like big bird's nests. You never see him standing on the hay he's trying to lift, straining to lift himself. He thinks if he could teach him that, he'd be some good, perhaps, to someone in the world. He hates to see a boy the fool of books. Poor Silas, so concerned for other folk, and nothing to look backward to with pride, nothing to look forward to with hope. So now and never any different. Part of a moon was falling down the west, dragging the whole sky with it to the hills. Its light poured softly in her lap. She saw it and spread her apron to it. She put out her hand among the hop-like morning glory strings, taut with the dew from garden bed to ease, as if she played unheard some tenderness that wrought on him beside her in the night. Warren, she said, he has come home to die. You needn't be afraid he'll leave you this time. Home, he mocked gently. Yes, what else but home? It all depends on what you mean by home. Of course, he is nothing to us any more than was the hound that came a stranger to us out of the woods, worn out upon the trail. Home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. I should have called it something you somehow haven't to deserve. Warren leaned out and took a step or two, picked up a little stick and brought it back and broke it in his hand and tossed it by. Silas has better claim on us, you think, than on his brother. Thirteen little miles as the road winds would bring him to his door. Silas has walked that far, no doubt, today. Why doesn't he go there? His brother's rich, a somebody, director in the bank. He never told us that. We know it, though. I think his brother ought to help, of course. I'll see to that if there is need. He ought of right to take him in and might be willing to. He may be better than appearances. But have some pity on Silas. Do you think? If he had any pride in claiming kin or anything he looked for from his brother, he'd keep so still about him all this time. I wonder what's between them. I can tell you, Silas is what he is. We wouldn't mind him, but just the kind that kinsfolk can't abide. He never did a thing so very bad. He don't know why he isn't quite as good as anybody. Worthless though he were, he wouldn't be ashamed to please his brother. I can't think so I ever hurt anyone. No, but he hurt my heart the way he lay and rolled his old head on that sharp edge chair back. He wouldn't let me put him on the lounge. You must go in and see what you can do. I made the bed up for him there tonight. Uh, you will be surprised at him how much he's broken. His working days are done, I'm sure of it. I'd not be in a hurry to say that. I haven't been. Go. Look, see for yourself. But Warren, please remember how it is. He's come to help you ditch the meadow. He has a plan. You mustn't laugh at him. He may not speak of it, then he may. I'll sit and see if that small sailing cloud will hit or miss the moon. Uh, it hit the moon, then there were three there making a dim row. The moon, the little silver cloud, and she... Warren returned, too soon, it seemed to her, slipped to her side, caught up her hand, and waited. Warren, she questioned. Dead was all he answered. Mary sat musing on the lamp. For okay, so let's talk about this poem. So there's this man, Mary, uh, or this woman, Mary, and Warren, her husband, he's a farmer, and they've had this Silas has come every year. He always comes to help them. And the last time he came, before he left, Warren said, hey, if you're going to leave, don't bother coming back again, because you're just going to go somewhere else to see if you can make some more money with somebody else. And so if you're going to go, don't bother coming back. So Silas does leave. 
All right, but he comes back now here, and Mary is the one that finds him, and he's not doing well. She takes him in and tries to, you know, help him. Um, she found him asleep by the stove. She brings him in, and she's like, Warren, you're when you see him, he's changed. She's not the same, you know, as he used to be. And so he's like, well, we'll see. Did he say anything? Did he say he wanted to help me, you know, di to ditch the meadow? And she's like, well, of course he did. But, you know, what would you expect him to say? But really, I don't think he's he's not going to be able to do that. He's come home to die. So don't you don't need to worry. He's not going to leave you again. And he kind of mockingly home because that's, you know, that's not his home. And that's when um, they say home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. So her heart, she is very compassionate and wants to him to die in peace, right? And so she finally talked Warren into, you know, accepting it. He's not hurting anybody. He's going to probably talk to you about the work that he's going to do here on the farm, but he's really not going to be able to do any of it. He's come home to die. Well, she finally talks Warren into going in to see him. So did you catch what the irony is at the end of this poem? The irony is that when she finally changes Warren's mind, softens him up a little bit, talks him into going in to see Silas to talk to him, he goes in and he's already dead. So it's kind of ironic that by the time he changes his mind, right, um, that she's already dead. So very, very sad, uh, sad poem. And we will look at one more today called Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. This one is also um a very popular one of his uh also can be used for different interpretations it literally stopping by the woods and watching the snow fall but i think there is more to it i think there's a, a deeper meaning and we'll see if you if you feel the same uh when you hear his poem here stopping by woods on a snowy evening You should probably read all your poems out loud. Dogs are very good to read poetry, too. Cats, not... Mr. Frost, is time a factor in the perfection of a poem? Mm -hmm. I was surprised to learn that you wrote that charming poem, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, in about 20 minutes? Oh, more or less, yes. Very shortly, very directly, putting, them right, putting it right through. Would you please recite it? You want to hear me say that? Certainly. Yeah. Stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake. The darkest evening of the year he gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. So there he is reciting that, uh, reciting that poem. What do you think? What do you think it means? Literally stopping by and looking at snowy woods. But what else? What do you think is the other meaning there? Um, especially in the last stanza there. I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. So, you know, it's, it's fine to stop and enjoy what we're seeing. But then we have to remember, you know, I have things that I have to do. I have promises to keep. I have a lot of things that have to be done. And we'll talk about this poem more when we uh, next year in AP Literature and del delve a little bit deeper into that poem. That's all we're going to do for today. We'll pick up uh, tomorrow and try to finish up Robert Frost. And so that is all we will do for today. Make sure you are reading your Silas Marner for next Monday.